Welcome to Lesson 33, The Fundamentals of Separations. It is May 1. I hope everybody is absolutely fabulous and being productive and happy to get through the month and be done with uh, this academic year. Um, today, just a reminder, your formal report on the PKA of Bronchiso Green is due on Lesson 34, so that's the 5th of May. And today we're going to begin the topic of separations. So in the realm of analytical chemistry, um, we oftentimes have to undergo a sample separation before we can analyze the many specific compounds within. So we are going to go over all of the details of the, the theory and the application of separations. Little photo here of Annie, she's a, um, extremely good gift opener so she easily separates her Easter Bunny from the wrapping paper. Sample separations are critical to analytical chemistry. Most samples that are being analyzed are extremely complex. You can think of an environmental sample and all of the thousands of different chemical compounds and species contained within and biomedical research so analyzing blood or urine or saliva and in a very timely um, set of circumstances um, the biomedical community were hot after discovering a drug that hopefully will cure COVID-19 and in research labs across this nation and the world um, people are carrying out many uh, chromatographic analyses that that is sample separations in order to isolate um, hopefully what's going to be the species the compound that's going to cure COVID so just one thing to know about when we carry out separations um, kind of usually have two goals in mind either we're we're just trying to figure out what's in the sample and at what concentration that's an analytical or research and development application once we are trying to create and produce a product and we need to isolate it so that we can then mass produce it and sell it um, that is a preparative application illustrated also in the lower right corner is column chromatography which we're going to spend most of our time talking about and the visual of how one carries out a separation with respect to time time increasing left to right here where we introduce a sample at the top of our column at different points in time different individual compounds within the sample um, traverse the column at different speeds and so at some point we're going to collect species one and then we're going to collect species two so on and so forth the fundamental way that sample separations occur is by exposing our sample to two different chemical environments those two different chemical environments are going to have different physical properties so we are going to have for instance um, phase one and phase two okay those are two different solvents one could be aqueous which if it's water it's going to be very polar and the other solvent could be some organic solvent that is nonpolar okay and by exposing our little molecules the little black dots here to those two different solvents two different systems okay our molecules if they are more like the aqueous phase you're going to have a bigger proportion of those molecules present in that phase and in this manner you know you can drain off the second phase and thus this the concentration of your molecules 
here in this aqueous layer are going to be bigger than in this layer. Okay, and so what happens is the molecules actually distributes itself into the two different phases. So there's some that goes into the aqueous phase, some that goes into the organic phase. Okay, and that proportion that's in the aqueous phase versus the organic phase is called your distribution coefficient. Okay, so that would be the concentration of our species in this aqueous phase relative to the concentration of our species in the organic phase. Okay, and in this illustration, that value obviously would be bigger than one. Most of you have already carried out chromatography in the form of paper chromatography or thin layer chromatography. Very simply, the way we carry out a sample separation, as always, we expose our sample of interest in the components within to two different chemical environments. We give the names of the mobile phase to the phase that, by virtue of the name, is going to move, and the other chemical environment is the stationary phase. In the case of paper chromatography, the mobile phase is whatever solvent we put down in the beaker. Okay, all right. And the stationary phase is the paper. And paper is comprised of cellulose. And cellulose has this chemical formula. Okay, and it's a polymer, obviously. And we have a lot of hydroxyl groups on the molecule. And if you'll remember this functionality, oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So we have very polar groups on the edges of this molecule. So those two chemical environments have a difference in polarity. And so we are going to place our sample of interest. We're going to spot it on a line that we draw. We put the paper down in the solvent. At one point in time, okay, we're going to find, in this case, we have singular components in each of the spots, different components. Um, so for this one, at some point in time, that component traveled this distance. At that same point in time, this sample traveled this distance. This one here, and that one traveled here. So we find the center of those spots at that point in time. Okay, at this stage, at this moment in time the solvent has traveled a certain distance up the paper okay and so we are going to measure the distance that our individual components moved relative to the distance that the solvent moved and that's going to define an rf value Okay, so the distance our component moved is the B measurement, and the distance that the solvent moved was is the A measurement. So the point is, the more my component is like the mobile phase, the longer it will stay in the mobile phase, and the further it will move up the paper. The less it's like the mobile phase, the further it's going to stay behind. So what we can infer from this diagram is that the yellow species is most like the stationary phase. In this case, that's the paper, which is polar. The component that moved furthest is the red one. This one is most like the mobile phase, and it spent the most time in the mobile phase moving up and that is the less polar component. And so I can infer that that molecule is probably a little less polar than 
is the green, then is the blue, then is the yellow. Column chromatography is no different than paper chromatography. We are going to expose our sample and its components to two different chemical environments, the stationary phase and the mobile phase. What's different is in column chromatography, the number of exposures is huge. It's tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of exposures, little exposures to those two chemical environments. By having so many exposures, we are going to be able to separate two different chemical species that have very similar structure and properties. Extremely powerful technique. So visually in time, what we're going to do op most often, we are going to have a column. Okay, this is what we call a packed column, as the name implies. We are going to have little particles of silica, that's our support material, and onto the surface of the silica, we are going to chemically react and place a stationary phase molecule on the surface of those little silica particles. We are then going to obtain a mobile phase substance, and that mobile phase is going to flow let me do a different color here. The mobile phase is going to flow over our packed column. You know, at some point we will have to introduce our sample into the column. The critical thing to recognize is as the mobile phase carries the sample over the packed column, Okay, every time my little sample molecule has the opportunity to interact with the stationary phase, okay, that's one exposure. And then it comes back out and it flows down and then it goes back in. Okay, then it moves on to the next particle. Okay, so the huge difference between column chromatography and the simpler forms is the large number of exposures and the powerful capacity to separate compounds of very similar structure and properties. The stationary phase material in most packed columns um, is a silica particle support, so silicon dioxide, and this is an amorphous solid which you have silicon with four valence electrons bonded to oxygen, and we have these alternating siloxane bonds in the bulk of the particle, so on and so forth. Okay, but at the surface of the silica particle, okay, um, those, those siloxane bonds um, react, and we have functional, what we call silanol sites. So this is a chemical point of attachment. So we can modify the surface and react the surface in this case with a silane molecule. And we can purposely place some stationary phase substance of desired property on the surface of our silica support. So this R group, okay, it could be a carbon chain that's just one carbon long, it could be four carbons long, it could be eight carbons long, it could be 18 carbons long, it could be, have an amine group sticking off so it's polar. Okay, so the R group, um, we can design the stationary phase to have any property based upon the property of this R group that we chemically attach to the silica surface. The reason that silica is a wonderful support material um, is that the particles have a huge surface area. So this is where we get that huge number of exposures to the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So illustrated here is a, an electron micrograph of silica particles and they are porous. They have a pore structure. So you've got these spherical particles, but as you can see, 
we have pores. So, so the surface area is not just the outer surface area, but we also have all this inner surface area within the pores. And that's where we get to this huge um, area within which there can be interaction of our species and our sample with the stationary phase material. When we do column chromatography, it's referred to as either normal phase or reverse phase. That has to do with the property of the R group that we're putting on here. Okay, if our stationary phase is more polar than the mobile phase, for instance, if that R group was this one with an amine group sticking out, that would be pretty polar if my mobile phase was an organic solvent. So we would be conducting um, chromatography with a normal phase. In the reverse phase, the stationary phase is less polar than the mobile phase. So if we have one of these alkyl chains as an R group, okay, those tend to be nonpolar. So if we're using a slightly polar solvent, um, whether it be acetone or something like that, um, it would be, we would be conducting the separation in the reverse phase. We classify our chromatographic techniques based upon the nature of the interaction of our analyte species with the stationary phase, starting with adsorption methods. Okay, AD implies an interaction with a surface if I have absorption, a B, that is an interaction with the bulk of a phase. So in our adsorption methods, it's going to be an interaction with the surface. In these techniques, we simply have the silica particle that is not modified with a stationary phase material. We get our molecules to come out of the mobile phase, the little green molecule at some point is going to be attracted to the surface. There's a physical attraction there to the surface. It will hang out, spend some time on the stationary phase. And at some point it comes back out into the mobile phase and traverses the column. The techniques are gas solid chromatography or liquid solid chromatography. So the names are based upon the nature of the phases. So in gas solid chromatography, the mobile phase is a gas and the stationary phase is a solid, the solid silica particle. So that's your GSC, gas solid chromatography. In LSC, the mobile phase is a liquid and the stationary phase is the solid silica surface. Okay, other group of techniques, the means of separation is partitioning. Okay, these are the techniques in which we have the silica particle and we have either physically coated or chemically attached some stationary phase material, okay? And then the nature of the distribution, I have my mobile phase out here, okay? My molecules are going to come out of the mobile phase. They will partition into the stationary phase. They will spend some time in the stationary phase and then they will come back out into the mobile phase and be carried down the column. Those are our partitioning techniques. So because this stationary phase material is considered a liquid, okay, the, the names of the techniques, gas liquid chromatography. So in that case, our mobile phase is a gas and then liquid liquid chromatography if our mobile phase is a liquid. The next group of techniques are our ion exchange chromatographic methods. 
Okay, here we are going to take our silica particle. We're going to chemically modify it with a species that has a charge on the surface. Okay, so initially you have, let me do this again. Initially you have a cation and an anion on that surface. Okay. And my mobile phase is going to carry down analyte species, some of which are ionic in nature. And so if I have a red anion, okay, that red anion can displace the little green anion. And it's going to get carried down in the mobile phase. Okay, it'll hang out there for some time and at some point it'll come back off and be eluted. Okay, these are our ion exchange methods. Okay, and the technique is ion chromatography, IC. So you can have cation exchangers or you can have anion exchangers. The next group of techniques, we create separation on the basis of size. That's called sieving. Okay, all right, so we're going to design what we call gels that have pore structures of different sizes. So, for instance, molecules that are small, like these green ones, will be able to come out of the mobile phase and partition into the pores and will spend time in the stationary phase. Larger molecules will not get into the pore structure. And so they're not going to spend much time on the stationary phase. They're just going to go through quickly. So we are separating on the basis of size. The names of these techniques, there's <laughs> many names for the same method, um, either size exclusion or molecular exclusion, also called gel permeation. Finally, we can separate on the basis of very specific chemistry. So in these methods, I can take a silica particle I can chemically attach a very specific molecule like a substrate. So now if I'm separating a biochemical mixture, the only molecule that's going to get caught on this surface is the enzyme that fits in that very specific lock and key structure okay so i can separate very specific molecules and once again this is done a lot with biochemistry and molecular biology so basis on specific chemistry this is called affinity chromatography so these chromatographic methods are robust they're designed for basically any kind of sample we can think of and they are very effective this slide illustrates the same as the previous. It's just a different illustrator. So um, just if it makes more sense, this illustrates our adsorption methods. This illustrates our partitioning methods. This illustrates our ion exchange methods. This illustrates our gel permeation or size exclusion. And this illustrates our affinity chromatography. Now we want to focus our attention to what is happening for the separation as a function of time. So when we carry out separation on a column, okay, once again, we introduce the sample here at the head of the column, okay? We have components that are going to spend some time in the stationary phase, some time in the mobile phase. The more time they spend in the mobile phase, the faster they come through. So in the illustration here, this red species is being spending more time in the mobile phase. So it's going to come out sooner as a function of time. Once again, time is kind of elapsing as we look at this illustration left to right. Okay, all right, so that red species spent more time in the mobile phase, less time in the stationary phase. It comes off first. 
the blue species spent more time in the stationary phase, it got hung up, it comes out later. Okay, so if you would look at the profile of the concentration of these species at different points in time as they traverse the column, you know, here they are together at the head of the column time zero. This is at some point in time later. Oops, let's go back and get rid of that dot. Okay, time one. This is time two, time three. Okay, so ideally what our goal is in a sample separation is this, to have these components cleanly coming off the end of the column individually. And that plot of the how we know when they're coming off, we have some analytical signal, we have some detector, um, that identifies when something comes off the end of the column as a function of time. The critical parameters that we want to measure when we carry out a sample separation are as follows. Okay, here we have our mobile phase substance. Okay, it's flowing in this direction. Okay, we are going to introduce our sample by injecting that sample into the flow of the mobile phase. The mobile phase is going to be carried down onto our column. That column is going to contain our silica particles onto which we have chemically attached our stationary phase material of interest. Different components will spend different amounts of time on the column. At some point they will come off the end of the column. I will place a detector at the end of the column that is going to give rise to some analytical signal that tells me that something has come off and the magnitude of that signal will be in proportion to the quantity of that thing that's coming off. The record of the things coming off the end of the column as a function of time, that record is the chromatogram. Okay, so this is an illustration of a chromatogram in which we are looking at the detector response on the y-axis as a function of time, okay? Keep in mind that if a component spent zero time in the stationary phase, it would still take some amount of time for what we call an unretained component to traverse the column. Okay, the time it takes for an unretained component to come through, we're gonna go T sub M, I guess it's time of the mobile phase or a non-retained solute. Okay, so on the chromatogram, we make a note of when the sample was injected. Okay, at some point in time, okay, an unretained component will come off. Okay, the amount of time it took for that unretained component to come off, we represent as T sub M or T sub zero. Okay, if I had a single component in my sample and it came off at some point in time later, according to this nice smooth little peak right here, okay, we defined the retention time for that component, T sub R, as the time between the injection and when it came off, the middle of that, that peak. Okay, so we have the time of the unretained component. We have the retention time of my component of interest. Okay, we oftentimes like to work with what we call an adjusted retention time, T prime R. That is simply taking my retention time and subtracting the time it took for a component that spent zero time in the stationary phase. Okay. Another parameter we like to measure is the width of the peak. Let me get rid of some of this illustration here for a minute. All right, so 
the width of the peak, how we, we get it, we draw a baseline, we draw straight lines down the sides of each peak, okay, where we have intersection of the baseline and that extrapolated line. This becomes the width measurement of my peak at the baseline. In addition to measuring the width of the peak at the baseline, as is illustrated here, once again, um, drawing the baseline, extrapolating the sides of the peak down, and then the distance in between. Um, sometimes it is more convenient to measure the width of the peak at half the maximum height. So if the maximum height of my peak, it's this tall. If I come half of the way up, that's right here. Okay, so sometimes it's convenient to measure the width of the peak halfway up. Okay, if there's some funky stuff happening at my baseline, sometimes this is the cleaner measurement of the width of the peak. So this is the width of the peak at half height. There are some very important parameters that we like to extract from the data in our chromatogram that's gonna tell us something about the nature of the components that we have separated. The first chromatographic parameter we like to um, measure and calculate is the capacity or retention factor. The retention factor has to do with how long that component spent in the stationary phase. Okay, the longer it's, it interacts with the stationary phase, the longer it is retained on the column. Okay, the longer it's retained on the column, that has something to do with how similar that component is to the stationary phase material. We measure capacity factor, uh, small k, by the adjusted retention time for that component over the retention time of an unretained component. So it's a relative time perspective. So if one wishes to delve further into this relationship, it's the time spent in the stationary phase relative to the time spent in the mobile phase. And we can actually go back and uh, derive that this is equal to that distribution coefficient, okay, the, the coefficient of the concentration of that component in the stationary phase relative to the mobile phase, okay, um, multiplied by the volume of the stationary phase material divided by the volume of the mobile phase material. The retention factor has to do with how similar that molecule is to the stationary phase. The selectivity factor, alpha, is a relative measurement of two different components being separated. So below you see a nice illustration of a chromatogram. Okay, we have time zero, this is where we injected the sample. We have the time of an unretained component here at 60 seconds. Okay, we have two components coming off. Component A comes off at 360 seconds. Component B comes off at 600 seconds. Okay, I oftentimes like to calculate a selectivity factor for those two components. Okay, this is going to be the adjusted retention time for the component that comes off later, okay, component two or B in this case, relative to component one or A, okay. That tells me something about the relative amount of time that the components spend um, in the stationary phase uh, with respect to each other. And that, um, because of the definition of the capacity factor over here as the uh, adjusted retention time over the time of an unretained component, okay, we can derive that 
the ratio of these retention adjusted retention times is equal proportionately to the ratio of their respective capacity factors, which as we can see further is equal to the ratio of their distribution coefficients. A very important chromatographic parameter that we must measure and be aware of is resolution. The whole point in carrying out a sample separation is to physically separate the components from each other and detect them. The measure of this is their resolution. This is defined as the capacity to distinguish two closely lying peaks. And once again, this is our ultimate goal in carrying out the separation. So uh, from a numerical perspective, okay, we say that two peaks are resolved if the measured resolution has a value of greater than or equal to 1.50. How we measure resolution is as follows. Once again, we have this nice chromatogram down here of uh, the separation of two components. So we have component A with its retention time and adjusted retention time. We'll go component A and retention time of component B. Okay, this would be the 360 seconds minus the time of an unretained component, which would be 60 seconds. So the adjusted retention time of this peak would be 300 seconds. For B, it's gonna be the 600 seconds minus the 60 seconds. So that's gonna be 540 seconds. Okay, so there's your adjusted retention times for those two peaks. Okay, we can measure the resolution between those two peaks using this equation over here. We're gonna take the difference in their retention times, okay? And then we're gonna divide by the average of their peak widths, okay? All right, so the difference in their retention times is going to be, as we mentioned, the difference in these times, okay? So if we do the absolute retention times, it's gonna be 600 minus 360 seconds. Okay, and you're gonna get the same value if you use the adjusted retention times or the retention times. Okay, so that's where you get your delta TR value. The width average, so once again, we can measure the width at the baseline down here for each of these. Okay, so what we're gonna do is measure width A and width B, and we're gonna get an average value. So width A plus width B divided by two to get the average, okay? If it's easier or um, we have some problems with the baseline, sometimes we measure the width at half height, which is the case up here and here in which, let me use a red pen here, sorry. So half height. So we have data for the width at half height for these two peaks, okay? So if you'd rather use the width at half height, it's this equation. You take 0.589, the difference in the retention times, divided by the average width at half height. Okay, when you calculate that value, you get a value for R. If that value is bigger than or equal to 1.5, we can say that those two peaks are resolved. So resolution is the ultimate goal of our separation. So we need to be on our toes to be able to look at a chromatogram and know if we have separation or not, if we have resolution. So what a chromatogram might look like if we have very poor resolution, okay? If you see something that looks like this, okay, this is an illustration where we have two peaks very close together 
And if you co-add the contributions to the detector signal, it's just one big broad peak. So this is what it might look like if the resolution of those two peaks had a value of 0.5. Oftentimes you can get features that look like this, in which obviously you have two different components coming off in a close period of time, okay? And this is what it would look like if our resolution was 0.75, okay? Um, we can adjust some parameters with our separation, and there are many. We'll talk about this in great detail later in gas chromatography and liquid chromatography about the specific operational parameters we can change to get better resolution. Um, but this third chromatogram shows we're doing a better job separating our peaks. Here we have a resolution of one but we don't have the ultimate goal, which is baseline resolution. That is where each side of each peak comes down to the baseline before something else comes off. So that is the ultimate um, criterion for resolution. So in order to have this magical resolution value of 1.5, we must have baseline resolution. So that means this peak comes off, it comes down to the baseline before this peak comes off. That is a clean separation and we have resolution between those peaks. Column efficiency, known as capital N, number of theoretical plates, is a critically important chromatographic parameter. This is a theoretical number that illustrates the number of interactions between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So in order to get separation of two molecules, two species that have very similar structures and properties, we must have a very large number of theoretical plates. So it is the that number, the magnitude of that number uh, reflects the resolution capacity of our of our column. How we measure theoretical plates, we do so based upon the data of individual components in the chromatogram. So if this is the peak for component A, I can calculate the number of theoretical plates of my column based upon this peak. I simply take 16 times the retention time squared over the width of the peak squared. An alternative way of calculating this, if you prefer to use the width at half height, once again, you measure the height of the peak, you come halfway up, you measure the width there. Okay, that's your width at half height. You can use this equation in which it's 5.55 times the retention time squared over the width at half height squared. Peak asymmetry is a very undesirable feature in a chromatogram, but unfortunately it is very common. So instead of having a normal Gaussian distribution, a nice symmetrical peak, it is very common to have what we call tailing and or fronting, okay? So you can see on the left, instead of my component coming off in a nice symmetrical distribution like this. Instead, I have some of my species coming off at later points in time, trailing other molecules that have come off. This is called tailing, and we can measure the extent of the asymmetry of the peak by this, this T value, the tailing. Okay, in which you would draw a line to the top of this peak first, and then you would measure the distance between the front and that peak there, that's the value A. And then we would measure this distance B, okay? 
and that ratio of B over A is the tailing factor. In a similar way, we could have fronting and you would do a similar measurement in which you would measure And, once the, and one thing I forgot is you make this measurement at 10% of the height of the peak. So 10% of the height of the peak. So we're going to come up where it's 10%. And then I'm going to measure the distance on the symmetrical side. Okay. And that would be the A measurement over here. And then this would be the B measurement over here and that would be the measure of fronting of that peak we are going to talk extensively about why we get tailing and fronting of peaks when carrying out chromatography we oftentimes have to do a lot of adjustment of the nature of our mobile phase or stationary phase depending on if we are doing gas chromatography or liquid chromatography and so we need to have a way of knowing um, how many theoretical plates we need to affect a certain resolution between two components um, that have certain properties. So if we know the selectivity factor alpha of our two components of interest, and we know the capacity factor for one of those components, and I need to affect a resolution of at least 1.5, I can predict the number of theoretical plates that I would need to carry out that separation, whatever that might be. So these are all mathematical relationships based upon the equations we looked at before, but this just gives you an idea of um, how effective your column has to be in terms of number of theoretical plates to carry out a separation of two components that are very similar in terms of their selectivity factor and the capacity factor. This slide illustrates a very important thing to recognize when one is carrying out a sample separation. We have to play around with the operational parameters of the separation, and there are limitations to which um, we can ideally carry out that separation. Okay, when we carry out a separation, the ultimate goal is to separate the components and have resolution. So, to successfully carry out a separation, resolution is mandatory. The other parameters, though, that we can play around with are time, how long it takes to carry out the separation, and the capacity. Okay, The capacity has to do with how much sample I can put on the column and still get a clean separation. So keep in mind, when we have our little silica particles, okay, each silica particle has some amount of stationary phase on the surface, okay? And you can think of the stationary phase as little parking spaces. There's only so many parking spaces. So if I already have substances in my stationary phase, Okay, and another molecule that wants to get into the stationary phase is coming down the column, okay, but all the parking spaces are taken, it will not have the opportunity to interact with the stationary phase and it will move through um, in a manner that's uncharacteristic of the property of that substance, okay. This is what happens when we put too much sample on our column. We say we have overloaded the column and we have um, overcome the capacity of the column. So the parameters of our separation are the resolution, the time it takes to carry out the separation, and the capacity. The more stationary phase material we have, the longer it takes to carry out the separation. So 
we can only optimize two out of these three parameters at a time. So we have to choose. Okay, resolution is mandatory. I must have resolution. So this must be one of my two parameters that I optimize. Okay, the other parameter that we are going to optimize at the expense of the third deals with our goal of our separation. Okay, so we do separations based upon one of two goals. Our goal is either analytical, we're carrying out the separation to find out the specific components within the sample and how much of each is in the sample. Okay, and in that case, our second parameter of interest is time. We just want to carry out this separation as fast as we can to get the clean separation and the information we seek. Okay, if we carry out the separ separation to optimize resolution and time, we do so at the expense of capacity. Okay, we're not going to be able to put much sample on our column. The other reason for carrying out a separation is because I'm an industrial pharmaceutical company. I've discovered the cure for COVID-19. I need to mass produce it. So I'm going to make vast quantities of this substance and I have to get it to traverse a column and you can see <laughs> a preparative column is enormous. Look at the human being and the size of this column. Um, and the goal is simply to separate and isolate my component, okay, and mass produce it. So in that case, the goal of my separation is resolution, okay, and capacity. I need to put a ton of material on my column, okay. I must have a lot of stationary phase and capacity on my column. Okay, so when I carry out that separation for the preparative purposes, I do so at the expense of time. It's going to take a really long time to put a large quantity of sample on this massive column that has huge capacity. And this ends the material for today. We will continue our discussion of the fundamentals of spectroscopy, um, sorry, chromatography and the effect of band broadening on our resolution.